Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the great book of Daniel, My God is Judge, and uh, chapter 9. We, we uh, are still back um, uh, where Daniel would be eight, about 87 years old, about the same age he was in the last chapter. But um, And we have Darius, which was Cyrus, basically. It is thought by many scholars. And with that having been said, Daniel is kind of telling us how it would be, the things that would befall. But who is it that's really telling us Almighty God? Okay. So, chapter 9, verse 1, and it reads, In the first year of Darius, that, that, that's a name that means maintainer, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which uh, was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. This is to say, these were our, this, these, their land was what we would call Iran of today, and he was made king over what we would call Iraq of today, uh, above the Persian Gulf. Verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Where, where is that uh, written? And you know that it was written in Daniel, um, Jeremiah rather, chapter 25, and I'm going to pick it up with um, verse 11 and uh, so that you have that um, particular teaching and can know and understand. And this is what it says, the prophecy that was given to Jeremiah, which was given from the same God, because we only have one. And verse 11, it reads, And this land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. That's the years of the captivity. Twelve. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. And it would be from here that the final desolator king of Babylon would come. 13, and I will bring upon that land all my words, not part of them, all my words which I have pronounced against it even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. Now, so that you know and understand what time we're really talking about, verse 14, for many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. That's to say God's children. And I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury of my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it, and they shall drink and be moved. And the reason that uh, Daniel would refer to Jeremiah and that cup of God's wrath, you'll find out that ultimately that he means the 70, last 70 years that are determined upon our people for the king of Babylon which will come. In other words, it has to do with us today as well as the period of this time. That time being a type of the captivity, which now we're back to pure Hebrew, this being the second chapter, uh, return to pure Hebrew, and meaning our deliverance. And that's how God does it. So we'll pick it up then again, returning to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 3. And verse 3 reads, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 
this is that same Daniel whom God touched and whom God utilized, and here he's praying to the Father. I, I want you to note he's not necessarily praying for himself, but for his people, asking direction, asking God's um, um, influence upon the family, and so forth. That's what he's praying for. It never hurts to pray and to let our Father know that you love him and that you want him, his presence. Verse 4, and it reads, And I prayed unto the Lord of my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. There's a condition there, only to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. That's a condition. And Father does hold true to those that love him and those that do keep his commandments. You want to remember that in your life. If you want a blessed life, if you want God's blessings on you and your family, you, you let our Father, you communicate with him. Prayer is simply talking to our Father, letting him know that, that you love him, you care. For indeed he cares for you. That's why that cup, as, as people abuse God's children, that cup of wrath builds and builds. It shall be poured out when that time comes that our Father is ready. Verse 5, We have sinned, Daniel continues, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from the precepts, from thy precepts and from thy judgments. We've, we've left your word. Uh, this is something that's a no-no. You don't want to do that. Though Daniel and um, his friends would hold to that word, many of Judah and Israel did not. Verse 6, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. In other words, you sent us <clears throat> spokespersons that delivered your will and your way and we haven't listened to them as a matter of fact they crucified some of them verse 7 O Lord righteousness belongeth unto thee but unto us confusion of faces we don't even know who we are sometimes as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, to, and unto all Israel. This is both houses, Judah, Israel, and the city God loves, that are near and that are far off through all the countries where thou hast driven them because of their trespasses that they have trespassed against thee. This was God's promise. He said, I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth when you disobey me. And, and they are scattered even to this day. Those ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains were then called Caucasians and settled Europe and many later migrating to Canada and the Americas, uh, making up the house of Israel. Not the house of Judah, but the house of Israel. And in that he scattered them, they have confusion of faces because many, they don't know who they are. They, why? They haven't followed his precepts. They haven't followed his commandments, and they certainly not too often even tell him they love him. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belong confusion of face. Understandable. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. That being the reason is to sin and leave the righteousness of God, for God is always right. The sooner you can understand that and recognize it, in the moment you want to do what is right, you're going to follow his righteousness and learn by it, be corrected by it, be edified by it, whereby you receive his blessings instead of living in a world that's all confused, confusion of faces, not even to know that you're a child of God and where you fit in prophecy as to what it is you're supposed to do. You have a destiny, and many of you have known since you were a child you had a purpose, and you were never taught. But then when you get into God's Word, you see that destiny, 
as he speaks to his election as they're delivered up before the false ones. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgivenesses. Though we have rebelled against him, he still will when you repent. Verse 10, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Uh, I don't know, have you studied his word? Have you followed his word? Have you even tried to follow his word? Th this, is, this is the answer that many people search for as to why God doesn't bless them. You gotta kinda do it his way. You gotta stand for something or you stand for nothing. And when you stand for nothing, God can hardly use you because he has a purpose. And to be purpose driven is to wanna do God's will, God's way, not man's way, and certainly not by man's traditions. Verse 11, yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of the God, because we have sinned against him. I wonder what curse that was. Well, maybe we'll find out. Moses wrote it. Verse 12, and he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. And so it is, that city that was once called Jebus because it had an unclean birth and God took it under his wing and made an everlasting covenant with the location Jerusalem that, on which it sits in Judea. And he wed it forever and it's where his eternal temp temple will be established as it is written in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 16 as well as the completion of it in Revelation chapter 21. How precious our Father is. And Jerusalem is the barometer. You want to watch it. Watch it closely. 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. What? Where was this written, and when did Moses write it? Well, he, he wrote it in the great book of Deuteronomy. He wrote it in the 27th chapter of Deuteronomy, and you can pick up on it there. You should read it, because it's very befitting of even this hour and this time. Verse 15 of chapter 28 um, in the great book of Deuteronomy. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses, here's the curse, this is what it is, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. They're going to take you over. Well, what in the world are they? Well, let's read them. 16. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. I mean, when you join house on to house, there's disease, drive-by shootings, druggies, you got it. And cursed shall thou be in thy field. You know, when you um, begin to take too many shortcuts, then you even have trouble in the field, which is to say the world. 17, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. I don't know, when you push a basket in a grocery store, do you know you probably pay more taxes on your grocery bill than what the groceries used to cost many years ago it's a curse that you allow people to enslave you through taxation and through usury well wonder why because we did not obey the lord god our father 18 cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. 
and it is too bad that sometimes we don't have the natural that we did. There's too many injections and so forth. 19, cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. In other words, without God, you don't have much of a chance. In this world today, when you look at it, the trouble, if, if you know, I, I don't really understand how people can keep their sanity in this world today if you didn't have the Word of God. If you didn't understand, it was planned long ago. And no one understand that it's simply God trying to get his, his, his people's attention. Uh, verse 20, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke. In all that thou settest thine hand uh, unto for to do until thou be destroyed, and until thy perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The, the Lord will do that. And, and certainly, how, well, how do you immune yourself with it? Inoculate yourself with the truth, with the word of God. Follow him. Let him know you love him. And you automatically become immune to all those curses because God will give you such blessings that you will override and, and blessings that will take care of, of the cursings that he would place on others. Why? Well, he loves you. And certainly God never curses those he loves. So returning to the 14th verse of Daniel chapter 9, there you have the curses he promised written by Moses as so declared in verse 13. Verse 14 reads, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil. He's aware. And brought it upon us, he allowed us to bring it on ourselves. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. God is always fair, and God is always righteous. But man brings stuff upon himself. God will allow it. If you want to take yourself down Primrose Lane, have a good trip, friend. I mean, we're, we, we're living a, we live in a free society. And if you want to go that route, hey, have a good trip. Go, go for it. But if you want God's blessings, it will not follow you. You walk uh, right to face to face with the curses he forementioned in Deuteronomy written by Moses, as he forewarned you. Well, how do I prevent that? Well, by reading his word and knowing how to avoid the curse. That's simple enough, isn't it? I think a child could understand that. Verse 15, And now, O Lord God, that thou that hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. God who parted the Red Sea, who fed the manna in the wilderness, brought them right out of where they were captive, enslaved in Egypt, freed them, brought them out into the promised land, feeding them. They still wouldn't listen to him. Verse 16, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, Daniel continues his prayer. I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are, becoming a, are become a reproach to all that are about us. And so it is. Look at her today, even. With... They, you can't cry peace, peace, peace there. Can't even get people to the peace table. And the fig tree is planted, both the good and the bad, as it is written that it should be in Jeremiah 24, four chapters before the 28 of the curses. I don't know, have you ever read it? It tells you about it. And, and God's love going out to his, his most favorite geographical spot the spot he loves so much is still in the hand of Gentiles. It won't always be. That day of coming, that day is coming of that cup. Verse 17. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant, Daniel speaking, and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary, 
that is desolate for the Lord's sake. In other words, um, look at it today. Look at the abomination. How, how sad it is, and our Father must weep. But that day is coming, and this builds the wrath of God. This is why that 70-year period is very important, and you want to pay close attention to it. Because at the end, if you noticed in Jeremiah, of the final 70 weeks upon our people, that cup's going to be poured out. And that time is approaching. That's why we're reading this, studying God's Word, line on line, so that we can understand. Verse 18, Oh my God, Incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations. And the city which is called by thy name, Yaroshalem. And for we, for we do, do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. So we don't deserve it. But with unmerited favor we know look upon us bless our people that again Daniel not praying for himself not even pray, praying for him and his three children the Hebrew children but praying for all of God's children being the being the very spokesman prophet for God utilized by God to to, to interpret dreams and visions here he pleads for that mercy from our Heavenly Father. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. Don't put it off. For thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Don't, don't, um, for your own sake and your own love of your children, take action. That's what Daniel is at. Bring the blessings. Uh, actually, the blessings come when one deserves them because God is always right and God is always fair. God will answer Daniel's prayer and God will answer all those that fall in line or in or attuned to following just as Daniel did in asking our God, our Heavenly Father, for His mercies to hear you but you want to remember also that uh, for forgiveness, you've got to repent and you've got to ask his forgiveness and then thank him for forgiving you. Get into his word, that right path, and stay on it as best you can. Verse 20, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain um, of my God, in other words, Mount Zion, verse 21, yet whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the even, evening oblation. In other words, um, uh, about the time for the evening offering. Here comes Gabriel in God loving Daniel, listening to his prayer. And God sends this one. Again, let me remind you, what is it Gabriel translates rather than transliterate? God's man or a man of God. Well, I thought he was an angel. Well, why did God name him Gabriel, which is to say man of God? Because all, all people in spiritual bodies are men and children of Almighty God, for he is the father of all. So God sends this one, and he sends this one to interpret. He sends this one to explain and to clarify. And so it is. So when he touched him, verse 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And this is what you want to remember. This is why you study God's word. 
just so that you can gain skill and so that you can gain understanding. Why is it so important to have understanding? Because it is human nature. It is the nature of man to only fear what he does not know. If man knows pretty well what's going to happen, he, he is a protective uh, creature. He will plan a way through it, over it, around it, about it, whatever. He'll take care of it. And that's the way God created his children. So wisdom is to understand what God is about to do, what the wicked ones are about to do, is a very important thing because it allows you to foreknow and to be ready. For ultimately, as it is written, God's elect must stand before the false Messiah, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them to take care of business. That's true wisdom, and that's why skill and understanding is so necessary, especially concerning the 70 weeks of time, the 70 years of time written in the great book of Jeremiah given directly from God. Was it given by Jeremiah? No, it was not. God gave it through that prophet, Jeremiah, because God is totally in control. God is in, he's ruling, he is in command, and God takes care of his own. And so it is that uh, he continues on. And uh, we go with the next verse, and Gabriel begins to explain. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And, and so it is that uh, here God never leaves us wanting. This is why it's so important that you pray for wisdom and understanding. When, you know, not everyone, or I would say most people, in God's overall plan, there's going to be times that you're going to have trouble understanding. So who do you talk to? You talk to him for skill and understanding. And here, this Daniel, who was so loved by God, God sent this one to leave this message for all of us, all of God's children, that exactly how it would be. God hears supplications. That's to say prayer, your wishes. He hears them well. And God will always do what is best for you. God will always follow through in that light. And he will, he will take care of you. He will keep you posted, and so it is. Now, what is the vision? We won't be able to go into all of it today, but we will get the first part. Verse 24, we may. And verse 24 reads, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, listen carefully, and upon thy holy city. That's why the city is so important to watch. It's the barometer. To finish, to, to do what? To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to, announce, uh, to anoint the most holy, that is future, meaning the very end shall come, and that's what these 70 weeks are about. Now, I want to jog your memory a little bit. Do you remember when Jesus walked into the synagogue? He picked up the scroll of Isaiah, and he read from that great scroll or book of Isaiah, and he said, this uh, day I have come for and in the name of salvation. This is the day of salvation. Now, he stopped in the middle of a sentence because the end of the sentence says, and the day of vengeance. The day of vengeance is the pouring out of the cup. 
So there is a gap between the day of salvation and the day of vengeance. Just as in this 70 week period, we're going to cover 69 weeks. And, and, um, and that last week will be broken apart. It's the gap, because it is the gap of the week of uh, vengeance, of which our Father will come, and he will take that vengeance. And it is so very important. Again, I want to remind you, Jesus went into the synagogue. He picked up the book of Isaiah, and he read that first part of the sentence, which stated, this is the day of salvation, period. There isn't a period there, but that's where he stopped. And to continue the sentence, it would be the day of vengeance. So we have that gap theory. Now, 70 weeks, 7 times 70 is 490 days, okay, or years. And 490 years, we have to take away 7 of those years, which would be one week of years. And that would leave us 483 and you know, it was an interesting thing. It was approximately that long when Christ would come at the first advent and would be anointed. But all those prophecies, such as all sin being done away with and everything made right, that doesn't happen until the second advent and at the end of the Lord's day, as you have learned from the great book of Revelation. Here we begin to see Daniel and the book of Revelation fit together like a glove. And the explanation of this prophecy as we go into it even explains to you the false Messiah, how he will come in, and then you will understand why Jesus would say in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then no one understand, flee Judea. Right? Because this is for this day. This is a prophecy concerning this generation of the fig tree. How good our Father is and righteous he is that he brings us these truths even before the fact whereby you are prepared. So we'll take that up in the next lecture. Don't miss it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, please. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Hey, if the spirit moves and you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. Why? Well, we're, that would be judging, and we do not judge people. God is judge, and we leave that judgment totally to him. And um, you have the privilege to discern what is right, what is wrong, who you should fellowship with, who you should study with. And, but don't judge. That's just not good, okay? Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You know, our Father loves you very much. That's why he created your very being, your entity, your soul. So why? he loves you. 
He made you different than anyone else. You are unique. So let him know you love him. Return that love in prayerfully talking to him. That's what prayer is, is simply talking to him, letting him know your wishes, and always pray for knowledge and wisdom concerning his plan, whereby you can be a better helpmate in that. Now, let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, Carol from Michigan. How can it be three days before the Antichrist that the two witnesses are here and three days before Christ comes? Please help me get this straight. Well, you're, you're not quite straight, okay? The two witnesses will come exactly um, by the solar days, whereas the, the Antichrist comes by moons. A solar day is 30 days long. A lunar month, moon, is only uh, 29, let's say, and a half days, give or take. Okay. So naturally, it's a shorter period of time, meaning the two witnesses will be here a longer period of a time. Originally, it would have figured out if it were to go the full week, would have been about 10 years, 10 days rather, 10 days before the false Christ. But when Christ shortened the whole thing to five months, then it makes it a, a little shorter yet. But it is true that as it is written in Revelation chapter 11, that when those two witnesses are killed and die in the streets of Jerusalem, the patha, which is an arena, then Christ will be here exactly three and a half days later. You will know it then at that time. If you're wise enough to recognize the two witnesses and to know and to understand our Heavenly Father. Now, Vincent from uh, California, my question is, why does everybody think we are going to be raptured home before the day of the Lord? Rapture isn't even found in the Bible. Well, that is true, and it is a, it is a bad teaching. And it is because people will not, f for a simple chapter such as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul the writer of most of the New Testament would say, I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. It is not going to happen until after the false Christ is identified and appears in Jerusalem, claiming to be God. And so um, this, this rapture thing throws a lot of people off guard, good Christians, because they really will accept Christ, the false Christ, thinking it is Christ, come to fly him away. That's his message. Uh, what does the Lord Jesus, why, what does the Lord Jesus Christ mean when he said, I came as a, I come as a thief in the night? I mean, what, what, if you, what is it about a, a thief in the night? You don't know when he's coming. If you knew when he was coming, you would set up and protect your home and you wouldn't be robbed. So all Christ meant was, is nobody's going to know when he comes. It'll be a big surprise. Uh, Rick from Missouri. But then I, I want to hasten to add, all wise will understand the season. Not the instant, but the season. Rick from Missouri, if people think we will be raptured out of here, though then brought back to fight as God's army. Won't that be the third coming of Christ? Thank you for teaching the truth. May God continue to bless you. Well, he sure does, and, and I appreciate that. It is true that there is no way God is gathering anyone out. He's got work for us to do. Number one, how can anyone read Mark 13, where God's true faithful servants will stand against the false Messiah, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Right here on good old earth, we've got work to do. We, a true Christian has work right here because the false Christ comes if he's a student of God's word at the sixth trump. Christ doesn't gather back to anybody until the seventh. That is what Paul was talking about when I forementioned 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. A child can read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and understand it. They just take their time without all the recapping of traditions of men and churches uh, wrongly teaching. 
a child that is innocent can interpret that for you, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and know there's nobody going anywhere until after the false Messiah claims to be Christ. That's the test. Cheryl from Michigan. A pastor told me that there are no full manuscripts around. Where are they and where can they be found? Well, there's some, there are, um, I would beg to differ with uh, the pastor uh, um, as far as, uh, that would be a little hopeless if you were to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. True enough, they're, they're just little uh, pieces. Uh, one or two books, pretty complete. But in the British Museum, we have uh, taken when the Brits controlled certain areas uh, in the Middle East, they brought manuscripts there. And uh, there is one particular church that has a library I would love to be in, but I will never be allowed. They have a pretty good set of manuscripts, and I will say no more about it. Tom from South Carolina. Uh, let, let, me, let me hasten to add, as a student of God's Word, with the Maserat, and the standard King James, you can pretty well put together anything God would have us know from his written word. Tom from South Carolina, is it wrong to help or support a church that does not teach what I believe? Uh, why would you want to? Uh, because you're, you're held, you are held responsible. Uh, you must make a note of the second epistle of John. Okay, just before Jude and Revelation in the New Testament. What does the second epistle of John say? If you, even as much, if somebody brings a different teaching than you believe or a different doctrine than the true Christ brings, if you as much as wish them Godspeed, much less tithe to them, you are a participant of their evil deeds. In other words, it makes you guilty of their evil deeds and false teaching and missing and misleading people. Why would you want to do that? I wouldn't want to answer for that. <clears throat> and the, the difference is if you know better or not, and if you don't know better, no problem. Okay? But if you do know better, that's a conviction, and I sure would listen to my father. Uh, David from Iowa. I am afraid of being deceived. I have been listening to you teach, and I can't remember everything. Will I be okay? You, as long as you remember that you love the Lord Jesus Christ, no one can remember every word of the Bible. Okay. And it, it is true that God gives certain people gifts of recall, whereby they can teach the Word of God with understanding. For true wisdom is to take that that might be complicated for some, and simplify it where anyone can understand it. But that is not necessary for a lay person. For a lay person is to know and to understand the order of events such as the false Christ is coming first. Do not worship him and stand against him. And you don't have to say anything. The Holy Spirit will do the talking as it's written in Mark 13. You do not have to be afraid. You're in good shape. Be strong. Uh, Melanie from Washington, I have a question. Do I need to say I love Jesus when I tell God love him, or is it a given since they are one and the same? Thank you very much for your teaching. You are so welcome. Well, this is, how did Jesus say you're to pray? Now, that's, what, that's why he gives you the example. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But you pray to Almighty God, our Father. But you always ask and pray as you complete in the name of Jesus Christ because that is your credentials that you have accepted the only begotten Son as your Savior. And that is very important. You pray to the Father, but you pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to document that you believe that God came in the flesh as the only begotten Son and that you uh, love him. Okay, this is Debbie from New Hampshire. I have a question for you. You keep saying 
so simple even a child could understand. I have read the Bible several times years ago and am very intelligent, but I absolutely could not understand the Bible until, until I started studying with you. I am trying very hard to read the Bible on my own, but I truly do not understand the symbology and Hebraisms without your guidance. I brought the Companion Bible to study guides you suggest in lots of books by Bullinger. I have a hard time getting through them because they are so deep, but I am trying. Do I have to understand everything to make it to heaven? Absolutely not. Okay. It, uh, there's, there's, what, what, is, what, what is John 3.16? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon him should not perish but have eternal life. You have eternal life by believing on the only begotten Son, knowing he is Christ, the Christ, the anointed one and that he was sent, and he is the salvation of this world. Okay, Larry from Virginia. Where is it written that God made the earth not in vain, but to be beautiful, to be inhabited? I don't remember where it was written. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. I'll say it again. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. He created the earth not void. The word in the Hebrew is tuhu. Okay, meaning just, I mean, completely a blank. He, he, God never created anything void or worthless. It was always beautiful. It was Satan's overthrow that caused, um, caused it to be uh, destroyed and then corrected into this earth age. Another from Debbie from New Hampshire. I have a question for you. I have asked God to forgive me of all my sins. And then life moves on and I ask for forgiveness for certain something, whatever it may be, if I miss some stuff because between, will it still be held against me? No, you always, you, you said it yourself, you repent for all your sins. You don't have to name them one by one, and even those you forget. When you say all, that means all inclusive. They're all forgiven. So uh, don't be so uptight. Relax, love the Lord, and enjoy life, okay? Uh, Sybil from South Carolina, uh, is there any documentation that Satan will pay off everyone's bills? Um, and um, also, are the elect the only ones that will go before the synagogue of Satan to be questioned? Well, most all others will be deceived by him. Uh, it is written that Satan comes in prosperously and peacefully. That's how he makes his way, by b prospering everyone, which means taking care of uh, bills, in part. Okay, that's that's the way. That's where he has his power. You know, a lot of people will sell their souls. A lot of people, if you said, "I will pay off all your bills," if you will, if Satan said, "I'll pay off all your bills if you'll give me your soul," a lot of people would because they don't believe in the eternity anyway. So don't, don't think it any great thing that when Satan, and we'll be hearing more of this before we finish the great book of Daniel. That's why in the last lecture, I insisted that you remember the verse where it said, he will come in peaceably and prosperously. That, that's extremely important. Why? Because everyone else teaches basically that the apocalypse is war and overthrow and horns and pitchforks. That's false. It's love, revival, and religion in a big way. And that's going to fool a lot of people if you're not learned in Father's Word. Uh, Bovell from North Carolina. At the catabole, the devil took one third of the angels with him, and they are locked in chains with him. If some are now born of woman in the past, now, now you're, you're mistaken, okay? A third of the people worshipped him. They did not fit as fallen angels. That's Nephilim. Fallen angels are only about 7,000 souls. Their sin was, as you read in the first six verses of Jude, they left their place of habitation rather than being born of woman 
they came to earth. That's why they're called Napa in the Hebrew tongue, fallen. A third of the people that worshiped Satan in the first earth age did not disobey God that they fell. They disobeyed. But to fall from heaven and to seduce women goes against God's plan of salvation. That's why he brought the flood of Noah and killed the whole bunch. Okay? But there was only about 7,000 of them. The others have a not, they're just people that were deceived then. God loves them and he hopes they'll accept salvation in this earth age. Shirley from Georgia. My mother recently passed away. Well, we're our condolences. Uh, she's with the Father. Will I know her as my mother in heaven? Of course you will. Your fleshly mother, you will know her. Uh, your documentation is in Ezekiel chapter 44. Begin reading with about verse 20 through 25, that if you are one of God's elect and you have a relative such as a mother, brother, sister, father, that uh, you can help them, you can assist them. That means tell them to get their act together, okay? But naturally to do that, you would have to recognize them. And certainly you will know her. Uh, Charles from Pennsylvania. Question, I have the Strong's Complete Dictionary of Bible Words by James Strong, 1996. Do I need a newer edition now? This one has been helpful in our studies with you. No, that should, if it's a good copy, there are some that, that uh, were computer generated that slipped a few notches, but it's not enough to, to, um, to be that um, um, destructive or to mislead. The one we now carry is, um, is probably one of the most complete that you can own at this time. There are some Strong's out there that are kind of bad. You don't want anything to do with them. That's why I suggest that you always get it through our library. That's very important. Um, Mary from Illinois. My question is exactly this. Why don't regular churches teach in the, on the three world ages? Oops, I think I just answered my own question. Regular churches don't teach three earth ages. Uh, you're right. When without this insight, the Bible clearly does not square with reality. Well, you're right. And unfortunately, um, unfortunately, in most seminaries, the ministers are taught to never talk about anything controversial that might drive someone away. And if somebody doesn't want to hear the truth, the real fact is you want to drive them away anyway. So that's that's kind of makes the difference, and and anything that is um, goes deep or is controversial. Um, as a matter of fact, if you're a Bible scholar, and if you teach God's word on national television, worldwide television, and you never do anything but teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, many of the regular churches will call you a cult. I do not understand how they can consider someone a cult that teaches God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Because most of them will take one verse of God's word and then ratchet jaw for 30 minutes. Uh, I don't know, but that's the way it is. The three earth ages, if you do not understand that there was an earth age before this, there's no way you can understand the artifacts that are obvious because they're found, discovered in, t in carbon dating as well as other types of dating. The, the, the animals, the dinosaurs, the mammoths, uh, the various um, animals from before, we find the artifacts of them, they existed. And do you know something? God's Word says they existed in the first earth age when it speaks of Satan's rebellion. But it is true. It's a sad state of affairs. But that's the way it is. Colin from Canada. Where in the Bible does it talk about hybrid and the fact that God does not like this to be done? Well, it's, it's in Genesis chapter 6 where the fallen ones we were talking about earlier came and impregnated women. And what was born from that? Hybrids, which were Geba, 
in the giants, in other words. Now, Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 24, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. Those fallen angels are still going to be giving and taking in marriage when they're cast out of heaven with Satan as the false Christ. Many, many people are going to be deceived by them. They're lookers and, and uh, conniving and supernatural. And, and uh, will deceive a lot of people if you're not founded in God's word. Michelle from Pennsylvania. My son is 16 and is very interested in girls and inappropriate reading materials and so forth. What scriptures can I use to redirect him and help him? Well, the, the word of God. But at the same time, Michelle, it is a natural thing for a young man to admire God's beautiful creation of the woman, of girls, the opposite sex. That, that is God's nature. Where God draws the line is when it's done with lust. Okay. That means to put the make on everything that moves. Okay. God doesn't like that. And that is lust. So um, because your son is natural, don't, don't be too hard on him, but let him know that what is acceptable and what is not. And uh, so be it. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. When you read the letter and talk to him, it makes his day, and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. God blesses those that bless him. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Again, blessing God, he always blesses you. He loves you. But there's one thing that's most important. You listen to me good. You stay in his word every day. In his word, it's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what? We're going to redo the rapture theory. That is to say the soundtrack. They seem to wear out. And then it's good to talk about it again afresh and, and uh, see if we can't dig a little deeper.